Um, Jackie, while we're waiting, I thought I'd uh, at least take care of some opening um, um, matters here. This is an opening statement that I have discussed with my counterpart um, on the Wenham Board of Health. And I will start as follows. So good evening, everyone who's attending. Welcome to our joint boards meeting. I have several procedural matters to cover first before we get started. Uh, first, I wanna ask the two boards to formally open the meeting and then the board members to introduce themselves. And also uh, I'm going to name any town officials who are present for this meeting, a, a town or school officials present for this meeting. So um, I'm gonna now call to order the meeting of the Hamilton Board of Health on September 14th, 2020 at 7.05 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. My name's David Smith, Chairman, and I'd like my other two board members to introduce themselves. Giselle Perez, board member. Christopher Small, board member. Okay, so all three members of the Hamilton board are present. Um, I believe uh, we also have present Mary Beth Banos, the superintendent of the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District, and um, Michelle Bailey, chair of the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District School Committee. Um, I, I haven't seen other town officials present, but if they are, I'm okay. David? And yeah, yes. Dana, Dana Alara is here. Uh, she's on the school committee and she also serves on the COVID response team for us. Great. Thank you, Hi. Michelle. Dana Alara here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Andrew, how are you doing? Well, I'm still waiting for another person from the Wenham board. So what you could do at this point, not to delay things is if you want to give your opening remarks and then when the second board member arrives, uh, then I'll call the Wenham board into order. But uh, right okay. now I don't see um, a second. So okay. uh, we're working on it. Jackie or Andrew uh, interrupt me when that happens. But um, so I will proceed with your approval. Um, the first thing I want to do um, is actually uh, uh, make a minor change to the agenda. And my purpose is to make this meeting more efficient and to avoid duplication of questions and answers that I'm sure we will hear as the meeting proceeds. And my plan is to move agenda items number three and four down to items four and five, and I'll explain that in a moment. Items three and four are update from the uh, Hamilton Wenham Regional School Dis District leadership and to review residents' feedback from our September 3rd public forum and move those down and move up to numbers three and four. The current item five and six, review all of the continuing efforts of the boards to assess and update the population numbers in the, the Hamilton in the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District metrics spreadsheets, also the epidemiological basis for the DESE COVID command metrics for selecting a learning model, and finally the latest COVID-19 data reports from DPH used as input for the board's memos, and then the other the, the current item six that I'm moving to item four is discuss possible updates and revisions to the final COVID-19 metrics for the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District report that was approved by unanimous vote of the boards at their August 26th joint board meeting. Uh, Andrew, or may I, may I have your permission to do that? Uh, yes, you may. And you can proceed with that, your opening remarks. Okay, thank you very much. All right, 
Uh, before we get started, I want to explain the ground rules for this meeting, and then I want to offer opening remarks about the subject matter for the meeting. In the Zoom meeting, we must have a set of rules governing our individual participation, or else this meeting is going to become an undisciplined free-for-all. So the co-chairs of this meeting, Andrew and I, will control the agenda, and we will announce the name of any resident or town official or participant who, whom we would like to speak. Uh, Jackie Bresnahan, fortunately, will be our Zoom microphone manager for this meeting. Um, and she will mute all participants except for the board members and anyone that our board asks to speak. Um, I want to caution everyone that we're going to conduct this as a civil meeting and we will mute anyone who uses inflammatory or foul language or who engages in uncivil behavior. Okay, now I'm going to place this meeting in its proper context. The main, although not the only subject of this meeting is the COVID-19 metrics document and matrix that we developed uh, by these two boards uh, at the specific request of the school district superintendent. Her intent in the request was to provide the district with a set of metrics that would help guide the district in selecting a learning model for reopening and for operating the schools. And those modes were of course, in-person, hybrid and remote. This process started at a joint Boards of Health meeting on August, I'm sorry, July 23rd, when the superintendent initiated a dialogue with the boards on COVID-19 by asking for our guidance on thresholds for changing the learning mode to a more restrictive mode from a full in-person mode learning. Her request was made and our response was provided on the understanding that these metrics were not, and I underscore that word, a mandate or a formal board order of conditions, but rather a guide for the district to help them decide on a learning mode. And I'm gonna interject here. And this is consistent with all of the guidance that pr was promulgated by Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'm gonna use the term DESI and the Department of Public Health, DPH, who stated in their um, various documents that of their expectation of a collaborative, a word I underscore, collaborative relationship between the schools and the boards of health. So I want everybody to clearly, everybody on this call to clearly understand this fact because our boards have noted that many residents seem to have misunderstood it. They seem to have misunderstood that what we issued was a mandate and not a guide. So I repeat, we issued at the superintendent's request and at DESE and DPH guidance, a guideline and not a mandate. Okay, um, now next I'm gonna summarize the introduction to our metrics document and the matrix so that everybody understands the context for this. And to do that, I'm just gonna succinctly quote from our report. It, the, metrics, the metrics below were prepared collaboratively by the Board of Health in Hamilton and Wenham to provide guidance on the reopening and operation of schools during this ongoing pandemic. These metrics are presented with the understanding that we're still dealing with a fluid situation and we've gotta be prepared to be flexible when making these decisions on the mode of learning and teaching that we employ at a particular time. Uh, so this metrics document provides a framework based on our current knowledge and is subject to change based on new scientific evidence or medical guidance. And during this unprecedented time of a global pandemic, we have limited experience and historical data on which to base our approach. And here's our summary. We, the boards, we are working to balance protecting the public health and safety of all of our students and staff with providing for the educational needs of all children. Okay, translation. There's no roadmap for doing this. There's no precedent for doing this. Uh, we're, we're, we're in uncharted territory. And so I want everybody to understand that we are doing the best we can with what we have got to work with. So timeline, over the month of August, the boards 
worked diligently, that's Andrew and I and our boards, worked diligently to develop the requested guidance and at the joint boards meeting on August 26th, and by the way, I'm gonna refer you back, the starting point for this was our July 23rd board meeting when this subject was first broached. At our board meeting on August 26th, we voted to accept the latest draft. That's about one month. And that's one month of work by a volunteer board, by volunteer boards, plural. We voted to accept the latest draft as a final metrics document and matrix, and we transmitted them to the superintendent. And a key input for our guidance was a two-page memo issued in the second week of August, I believe, by DESE, summarizing their guidance on learning modes. We also examined examples of guidance from many other schools in the US. And absent any context or documentation in the DESE guidance, I mean, that is, it was a, a chart with a set of numbers, period, with no references, no context. Um, and our two boards chose at that time to be conservative in our recommendations to the district and reduce those thresholds because we had no idea to what extent they may be conservative or not or what margins of safety or not might have been incorporated. So furthermore, I want everybody here tonight to know that we held, by my count, at least five public meetings dating back to July 23rd on these metrics. And in all of our public meetings, all we received were requests that we be conservative, that we err on the side of safety, um, that we, we, we be careful in the guidance that we recommended to the schools. Well, here we are today. Um, our work with the submittal back in August 26th of our recommendations to the school district. It didn't stop there. We've been regularly checking, checking for new information on this whole subject. And to wit, um, I've discovered a very pertinent report, quote, key metrics for COVID suppression, unquote, by a very reliable source, I mean, a credible source, un understated the word, understating the word credible, the Harvard Global Health Initiative. And I compare, and this was just in the past week, I just compared our metrics report to the Harvard report. And what I found was that the upper thresholds were overly conservative, that, that our upper thresholds were relative, overly conservative relative to Harvard's already conservative set of metrics. And specifically, the Harvard report recommended a threshold for moving from the yellow category to the, uh, or in their case, orange, in our case, red, of 10 versus our proposed threshold for moving from yellow to red of eight. And those were seven day rolling averages of daily new cases per 100,000 population. That threshold of 10, in fact, appears in several other reports that I've found, all from credible sources. Now, in addition, today, I finally, today, this is September 14th, after repeated requests, I received a reply to my inquiry about the DESI metrics from our Commonwealth Department of Public Health Chief Epidemiologist, Dr. Catherine Brown. She explained to me that the basis for the lower threshold for moving from green to yellow of Four, was chosen because at the time, the statewide level had stabilized at just uh, slightly below four, and DPH felt that that number represented a reasonable longer term epidemiological metric target for monitoring the state's status, progress, call it what you will, on COVID-19. So our proposed threshold of moving from green to yellow of three is arbitrarily lower without any real epidemiological basis. All right, one other relevant issue 
to this meeting is the fact that our originally draft our original draft of the metrics stipulated that two other key metrics should be included but in the course of our deliberations and our joint board meetings were they were deleted because we got criticism that they were making the metrics too complicated one of those that I recommended was the percent test positivity, and the other was the total of COVID-19 patients in local hospitals. Um, and the trends of both, the trends of percent positivity and the trends of hospital patients. Um, a COVID local organization report that's cited in the Harvard report recommends the former and the Harvard report recommends the latter. Consistent with recent conversations with the supervisor, um, I recommended and she agreed, we plan to put these metrics back into our oral reports to the district supplementing whatever written reports that we submit. And all of this follows the DESE metric guidance, which strongly recommends that school districts monitor the metrics beyond the average daily case incidents, such as what I just mentioned. And by average daily case incidents, what I mean is those single numbers, the four or the eight, or the whatever, the, the whatever digit you want to propose. Now, again, referring back to my point that this is a fluid situation, a moving target. Today, this is September 14th, I just received from Mary Beth Banos a copy of the letter that Jeff Riley issued today from Desi um, in a two-page letter recommending exactly what I've just proposed. Namely, you really shouldn't rely on a single numerical metric a four, an eight, a whatever, but you really ought to put it in the context of the bigger picture. What is the percent positivity and what is the trend of that metric? What, is, what, what are the hospitalizations for COVID-19 in your local hospitals, Beverly Hospital, North Shore Medical Center, and what is the trend in those hospitalizations? That's the kind of context that we kind of uh, in the interest of simplicity, brevity, uh, cut out of our metrics, but really should be incorporated. David, so, can, I, can I just interject? I, I have uh, another board member so I can call to order. Thank you, Andrew. Go, go ahead. Uh, hi, this is Andrew Tang. I'm the chairperson for the Wenham Board of Health, and I'm going to call our board into um, <clears throat> order. Uh, today is uh, September the 14th, 7 p.m. This is a joint meeting between the boards of Hamilton and Wenham uh, Boards of Health, and this is a Zoom meeting. Um, so will the other board member please announce himself? Jerry Dunnellan. Thank you. And when Regina uh, Baker arrives, if she arrives, she can announce herself. Thank you, um, David. Okay. Dr. Ting. Thank you, I Andrew. One note. That again? Uh, it's Jackie. I'm just making one note. Jerry, just so you know, because you dialed in on your phone, I have you unmuted. So if you want to mute, you need to mute yourself. So you have the power as a board member to mute and unmute instead of waiting on me to do that for you. Just as a reminder when you're on the phone. Sorry. Thank you. I think I am unmuted. <laughs> so they'd like to have me muted. Thank you. Okay. David, why don't you continue? Thank you, Andrew. All right. Um, I'm going to conclude as follows. Uh, coincidentally and very fortuitously on this matter, um, in the last uh, few days ago, I was approached by a resident of Hamilton who is a credentialed expert in epidemiology and infectious diseases, including COVID-19, and who offered his time voluntarily to review our report. Now, when we reach that point in the agenda, which will be shortly, I'm going to ask him to speak. But I, I also want to point out, I have received in the past couple of weeks more voicemail messages, emails, letters, et cetera, than I can possibly recall. And, and I appreciate all of them. I've tried to respond to most of them. 
and I'm fully aware of the various petitions that have been submitted to the Board of Health. Um, and and I, I want to thank every resident for the active participation that they've taken in this process. But um, in the interest of trying to maintain some sense of, of order to the meeting, which we really have to do, um, I'm going to now go to the agenda. That was my opening statement. Uh, item two on the agenda is COVID-19 update from public health nurses. Uh, fortunately, uh, Wenham's public health nurse, Mary Beth, uh, is, is able to attend ours. Uh, Christina could not. So I'm, I, she gave me this morning her report, which I will give after Mary Beth Ting um, gives hers. And, and these reports in past, they have simply been an update on what I call the numbers uh, from, from MAVEN and DPH. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, in terms of uh, COVID-19 statistics in, in Wenham, thankfully we have had no new cases. The last positive case we've reported was August the 31st. So we have had a nice reprieve from any positive cases. Um, additionally, I would say that one of the new things that has come out, David referred to things coming out from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed and they have released some guidance um, between Friday and today. And some of that guidance uh, for the two uh, boards, I would like you to be aware that if you haven't seen the guidance that's come out, DESE has um, now asked that any single positive COVID-19 case in a student or a staff member be reported to DESE they're not looking for personally identifying information, but they have set up what they're calling the DESE Rapid Response Health Center. And they're asking that um, the school districts designate a person who will contact DESE to report this. I think this is in an effort to um, address sort of if there are more, if there are cases in schools, because you know, the, uh, as David was saying, the, the number that guides the decision making from DESE is a 14 day retrospective average daily incidence number. And I, I'm only intuiting, I'm not certain about this, but they're putting this into place so that there's more direct communication between school districts, local boards of health and DESE if there are is a case or cases in schools so that they can be guiding the schools uh, with decision making processes and making sure measures are put into place. This comes at the end of a document that they've released about how to respond. They've updated their protocols about responding to a case either in a school building or on a school bus. Similarly, for the board members and the community, um, the also what's been designated is that DESE can make available to municipalities, uh, school districts, rapid response mobile testing. And there are certain um, minimum metrics that, that have to be met. Two or more students in a classroom, three or more in a cohort or 3%, whichever is greater, um, or 3% within a school. If there are that number of cases in any of those settings, it's designed that um, the schools will contact um, I, I forget whether it was initially the local board of health and then DESE, but there's communication mm -hmm. that will speak to, I, I misspoke, it's, it's the Department of Public Health that will speak with an epidemiologist at the state and the epidemiologist at the state will work to determine is this likely transmission that's happening in the school? And if it's determined that the transmission is likely happening in the school, then they can make available to the school district uh, mobile testing for asymptomatic individuals within that school. So that's very recent information that I wanted both boards and uh, the general public to be aware of. Um, one other, since this is a Board of Health meeting, I will just let the boards know that there was an arbovirus report today. Um, arbovirus refers to diseases that are brought to us from ticks or mosquitoes, and there have been four new identified human West Nile cases in Middlesex and Bristol County. And so we're um, continuing to advise residents that 
Um, although the risk from triple E has gone down because the species that carries the triple E is really waned with the cooler night temperatures, that's not true for the species that carries West Nile virus, which can cause a neurologic um, illness. Um, so residents are encouraged if you're out between dusk and dawn to wear long sleeves and pants and use um, mosquito repellent that has heat in it. So those are the updates that I have at this point in time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, uh, I want to uh, cite the numbers that I have at hand here for the town of Hamilton. In the town of Hamilton, we have had in uh, the month of September, a single K positive case of COVID-19. Year to date, our number of total cases remains at 47. Um, we are following in quarantine protocol six people. Um, we, um, the, those, those six people will exit quarantine protocol on September 21st, so in one week. Um, and I thought it was worthwhile, given what I said earlier, to cite two numbers. The uh, percent positivity rate in, in both, I think Hamilton and Wenham is less than 1%. And I was surprised at something uh, that I um, found today. You may recall at the height of the, um, uh, of, of the, um, the ec of this pandemic in Essex County, back in mid-May, we had in Beverly Hospital over 80 patients um, who had been admitted for COVID-19 uh, and a hundred and in North Shore Medical Center, over 120 patients were uh, in the hospital at that point with COVID-19. Today, those numbers are in Beverly Hospital, four, and in North Shore Medical Center, seven. If you just think, think about those numbers for a minute. That's really uh, an amazing progress. Okay, um, that, that's a quick update on COVID-19 numbers. Now we're going to move to um, the agenda item number five. And we're going to do five and six and then come back to three and four as we agreed at the beginning on item five. This is uh, reviewing the efforts of the boards to assess and update three items, the population numbers in our spreadsheets, number two, the epidemiological basis for the numbers, and number three, uh, the latest COVID-19 data reports from DPH. DPH. So let me start with the, the population data. And uh, Mary Beth Ting, I know you're pretty much on top of those population data and so would you be willing to update those for us? Yes, I'd be happy to. So on the, um, both the matrix, which is what we tend to be calling the colored document that's a visual representation, there's a footnote as well as in the narrative document, the uh, matrices, I think it's called. Um, we, we've designated that we source the population numbers from the UMass Donahue Institute, which does population studies. And um, when the decision was made to go remote, there was a lot of questioning about is that, that the number of cases from local colleges, uh, the seminary and the um, uh, Gordon College, were in, the case numbers were included and there was a concern about whether or not the population was included. And so I did check with um, three different organizations. I checked with Dr. Katie Brown, who's our state epidemiologist, and she said the state uses, in the weekly report, they use the UMass Donahue Institute number. So we're using the same data source. I checked with the Donahue Institute number and uh, Donahue Institute, and they said that they do include the student population in their numbers that we were using as our source. And then thirdly, I checked with both the town clerks of Hamilton and Wenham, 
and they inform me that the numbers that they include in population include the students. So um, I don't have the exact number in front of me. It's something like 5,300 or something for Wenham. And of those, uh, it's something like 3,800 are residents of Wenham, the remainder 1,300, whatever, are the Gordon College students. So from the outset in doing the, the math, the student population has always been included along with the case numbers. Okay. Uh, Mary Beth, I'm gonna put a postscript on that. Uh, about a week and a half ago, I reached out to our state representative, Brad Hill, on this question of the census numbers and how we should interpret them, what they, were, what they meant. And he went to the US Census Bureau and um, asked for their representative to call me. Today, I spoke with Anna Marie Garcia at the US Census Bureau about those numbers. And she confirmed for me uh, the basis on which the 2010 census was conducted. And that's important because it's the 2010 census that forms the basis for all subsequent projections of population year by year up to the new 2020 census, which has not been compiled yet. And she confirmed to me that the UMass uh, Donahue Institute is the authoritative basis for all population estimates in Massachusetts, and that it does include the student, the resident student populations at our uh, institutions of higher learning in Wenham and Hamilton. So I think we have a solid basis now for our population numbers. All right, um, moving on, item two. So the epidemiological basis for the, the metrics and the learning model, um, I wanna ask our board members, either Dr. Perez or uh, Christopher Small, uh, if you want to ask questions or comment on that, the matrix before I get to, uh, a, before I get to uh, uh, a statement, I want uh, our resident uh, Dr. Stephen LaRosa to make on the subject, but do, uh, do either of you have comments about that matrix? Thank you, David. I appreciate uh, your intro. I think it was very well put, very well stated. Um, and I just want to ensure that the public is sort of clear on sort of this, the purpose of this matrix. And I think you outlined it quite well, which is it was intended to be used as a guidance, as a guideline. Um, and the reason I say that is because my understanding with the matrix is as with many things that are true of life, especially when it comes to this pandemic that there's no black or white, there's a lot of gray area. So to take a number in and of itself in isolation um, fails to take into consideration a number of contextual factors. Um, so I think, again, my understanding with regards to when we were working on this matrix is that those factors do need to be considered. Um, and, I, and to emphasize that un, un, unbeknownst to, or at least unlike what the public might think, the Board of Health did not drive the closure of the schools. So I just wanted to make sure to put that out there because that was my understanding again of the matrix and to see if that was not the case. Okay. And, and you know, are we going to get everything right the first time in dealing with this pandemic. I hope everybody understands we're only human. Um, humans make mistakes. We're probably going to have a few false starts um, and maybe this is a good example of it, but we're trying our best to uh, understand exactly what, we, what we're expect, what's expected of us and how to respond to that and, and provide the best guidance possible. So. Thank you, Dr. Perez. David, I also have one more comment. So when, when we started this um, exercise um, back in July, I mean, obviously the numbers were much different and uh, we had looked at the data and thought that given where we both Hamilton and Wenham were in terms of numbers, we had actually, I think for both towns had gone four to six weeks without any cases at all at that at point that the mm -hmm. number we had picked was rather generous, we had thought. I mean, obviously, 
there are a couple of things we did not know. Um, for example, on the Gordon College side, we didn't know it, what kind of testing strategy that they were going to um, finally uh, occur because this was in July and um, that came out a little bit later. Uh, obviously, we were hoping that the numbers were very small, um, but obviously that those small numbers still had a, a significant effect on our numbers. But I think, again, as the board, both boards, our intent was, which is, again, difficult, is to balance the safety of the public versus the um, in-person in education of <clears throat> the children. And so we tried to do the best we could, given where we were at that time. And I think, you know, again, there were, as we're finding out, even DESE is providing guidance in the last days of the opening of a school, especially even today with the first day of opening of the school, they gave new guidance. So um, that is how quickly it's all moving. And so that's, you know, again, in our document, we had said that the fluidity of the, of what is going on could definitely have a huge impact. And since none of us here have had uh, ever been in a pandemic before, uh, we thought we would did the best that we could do. And so, again, we, you know, the, the intent was to be as positive as possible in terms of what we were doing. And um, obviously, you know, things occurred in a way that we probably did not anticipate, um, but they did. So now we are back here to discuss them. Right. I, I do want to say, and I, before we move forward, though, I don't necessarily think that it's a mistake being conservative. Um, and I, I, I was hoping with respect to the metrics, at least when I was considering it, it was with the intent of being proactive. So not to intend to schools, because that's not, I think, with respect to children, consistency is much more important. And there's a lot of concerns with the toggling back and forth that, that I would have myself, but really to take a pause and look and evaluate the situation. So the approach is to be proactive. But I have to say, and the reason I'm commenting right now is that the amount of vitriol I've been observing and hearing from individuals in our community is it has been quite disconcerting. Um, and I think it's important much in the same way that we as scientists are trying to broach this, this pandemic, um, gathering data and making the, mo the most of the data that we do have to work with. I think it would be important for the public to understand that the spreading of misinformation actually fuels anxiety, fuels mistrust and undermines our effort to be able to uh, effectively protect the public. So I, I think it's important to put that out there and I understand and I, I think it's important to acknowledge um, and validate the public's frustration with what has been transpiring over the past couple of weeks. But at the same time, I think that trying to sort of diminish or challenge the, the board members and their credentials is just um, not helpful um, or beneficial to the things that we're trying to accomplish. And the last thing I want to put together here, um, being a scientist and also a clinician, I think we have really focused on trying to consider the socio-emotional health of our children. I have two young children in the schools and actually one of my children were going hybrid. So trust me, as a full-time parent, this is impacting me as well. But I, I do want to emphasize that when it comes to the socio-emotional health of our children, don't forget that they learn from their parents. They're learning as they're observing how adults are handling challenging situations. So they're observing the way that we as a community are treating each other. So right now, this is a pandemic and it's going to last for some time. And I think right now we need to put trust that our board members are doing our best job given the information presented to us to ensure that we're maintaining our public safe. Dr. Perez, thank you for those beautiful, astute, and measured comments, and I really appreciate them. Um, okay, in this context, here, here we go. I, I, I consider myself extremely fortunate that I paid attention to uh, as, as many of the letters and emails and telephone calls and et cetera that I got, and through one of them, I received an introduction to Dr. Stephen LaRosa, who is a Hamilton resident and a, a credentialed expert in epidemiology and infectious diseases, um, something that candidly our boards actually don't have. And, you know, when you think about how could a, a, a board of selectmen or an electorate figured 
that they should be putting on a board of health, uh, a, a person of Dr. LaRosa's credentials, a couple of years ago before there was COVID-19. It just didn't seem, it didn't seem a concern at the time. So anyway, um, I've had conversations with him. Uh, he has been uh, generous with his time and expertise, which I appreciate. And uh, I want to introduce him. He's, I think he's on the Zoom meeting now. And I asked him to make a statement tonight in the context of agenda item, uh, as it appears on the agenda 5-2. And, uh, and I'd like us to take into consideration his comments in our deliberations. So Dr. LaRosa, please proceed. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I also want to thank the Board of Health for affording me the opportunity to speak, as well as my fellow residents in Hamilton and Wenham. By way of introduction, I am an eight-year resident of South Hamilton, and I have two children that are currently enrolled in the Winthrop Elementary School, so I have skin in the game, so to speak. Um, my credentials in commenting on the decision or the recommendation to go to all remote learning um, are the following. I hold an active and unrestricted medical license in Massachusetts. I'm board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease. I have over 20 years uh, of experience as a practicing clinician, including seven years at, uh, plus years at Beverly Hospital with experience in diagnosis and treatment of COVID. And I've actively published over 40 papers in the peer reviewed literature. So I have some understanding of data interpretation and statistics. When I recently found, about, I found out about the decision to go from a hybrid to a fully remote uh, learning um, uh, situation, I, I had a number of questions and comments. First, I looked into the DESI metrics and saw that the metrics for remote learning were greater than eight cases per 100,000 population using a 14-day moving average. I was perplexed by the fact that the boards had chosen a lower threshold of six per 100,000, as well as changing the moving average to seven days and uh, didn't really understand what the scientific data that drove those decisions was. Additionally, uh, I took note of a DESI guidance and David alluded to this in his opening comments of where they, they make a strong point that multiple weeks of data and multiple reports should be looked at to inform any decisions about the, the uh, place of, of learning. Uh, and um, when I saw the, the change in guidance to remote learning based on a cluster of positive tests at Gordon College, I think that goes against what Desi is saying, where you really should not be looking at one point in time, but trends over time. Uh, I also had a question about the uh, decision to split up the populations of Hamilton Wenham and the denominators, since anytime you cut down the number of uh, population that you're looking in a denominator, very few cases can then trigger you over a threshold uh, for changing um, uh, the recommendation about where to, uh, to take place in learning. The, the other issue is around Gordon College, which was a cluster, and, and I think Desi and, and many other sources make the point of you really should not be using uh, data from hotspots, such as a college or other population, when you're estimating the general risk to the Hamilton Wenham uh, to a population in general, such as Hamilton Wenham and the, and the children. Uh, I was happy to hear that David mentioned the Harvard Global Health Institute um, uh, guidance, which uses a seven day average of new cases over 100,000 in determining local risk. And as David mentioned, they use um, uh, one to less than 10 cases per 100,000 population places a location in the yellow zone. If you looked at, at the data, the most recent data from Essex County, a seven day moving average, we're at 5.8, which places us in the yellow zone. And according to the Global Health Institute's guidance, uh, 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 lo locales that fall into the yellow zone uh, in-person uh, learning is acceptable as long as there's a pandemic, resilient teaching and learning spaces can be achieved. So uh, in their guidance, yellow zone means that in-person learning can take place. The other uh, point that David uh, mentioned was uh, going by new cases, you can actually underestimate the actual risk of disease. So uh, a more useful metric is actually the percentage of positive uh, COVID tests. 
And a, a test positivity rate greater than or equal to three is considered high. Well, fortunately for Hamilton, the most recent test positivity rate is 0.88%. And for Wenham, it's lower at 0.33%. And for Essex County, a, as a whole, it's low at 1.88%. So I think that also uh, helps us in understanding the risk within our community. Again, I'd like to emphasize that th this is a disease of hotspots. Large mass gatherings without social distancing, workplaces, bars, in restaurant dining, and long-term care facilities, and that a cluster of certain cases does not adequately reflect the risk to a uh, school population. With respect to children, I think it's uh, comforting that uh, it's actually the, uh, a very small minority of cases is being driven by children under five, uh, and the, uh, excuse me, children under 10, and that also there's good data the children uh, less than 10 years of age are much less apt to actually transmit the disease to adults. I think a, a, a really big question for most parents, teachers, students, and the, the community at large is how likely is it that somebody will show up at one of our schools with COVID-19. And fortunately, there's actually good modeling uh, techniques that have been uh, developed at both at the New York Times and the University of Texas COVID-19 Modeling Consortium that helps us assess this question. So if we look at the at most recent Essex County, uh, Massachusetts data and use that in the model, a school of 100 would be expected to have zero cases and a school of 500 within our community would be expected to have one case. The enrollment at Winthrop is 332, Bucher is 257, and Cutler is 278. And if you're doing hybrid learning as an option, as well as having multiple pods, it makes it much more likely that the chance of showing up uh, at one of these schools with COVID would be closer to zero than to one. We also can uh, look at experience of return to school in other countries, such as the United Kingdom and Denmark, as well as ongoing in-person schooling in Sweden to show that there's been very few cases occurring in schools and very few school outbreaks. Additionally, the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention published a report on August 6th, and I've included for the minutes uh, links this, where they have shown very little evidence of uh, transmission within schools. Finally, the Massachusetts Medical Society uh, has also acknowledged that uh, has put out a statement where they acknowledge that uh, coming this, while we don't know what's going to happen going forward, they support the safe and equitable return of as many students, teachers, and support staff in po as possible to in-person school settings. So in, in summary, uh, I'm of the opinion that the, the metrics uh, by the boards of health have, uh, that resulted in the re recommendation for remote learning only is not substantiated by, by uh, data. Uh, and that furthermore, there are additional guidances, data, and modeling techniques that support the reinstitution of in-person learning with at least a hybrid model, as long as we have appropriate safeguards, including limited class size, physical distancing, mask wearing, and good hand hygiene. And I think uh, we could proceed along these lines um, immediately. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Dr. LaRosa. Uh, now, I'd like to um, go to item three of, I'm sorry, item five three on the agenda, and that's the latest COVID-19 data reports from DPH used as input for the board's metrics. I actually think we've covered that uh, between the report that uh, Mary Beth Ting gave and that I gave from our public health nurse and numbers just cited by Dr. LaRosa. It seems to me that um, we, we actually are in, in a pretty good state with the COVID-19 numbers. Um, hey, David, I, just, just a comment after, after uh, Dr. LaRosa's um, um, uh, evaluation of, the, of our situation. And I think one of the things he had mentioned was you, you, when you use a small population, you know, small changes in the numerator compared to the denominator are significant. You know, Desi made recommendations, obviously, of, you know, hybrid learning between a four and eight incidents per 100,000 uh, of a roll average 14 days. But they also gave a recommendation that for school districts that have multiple towns, that they had recommended using numbers from a single town 
in this case, they had recommended just using Hamilton. So I just want to be clear that, you know, if that's the case, and maybe Dr. LaRosa can speak to it, we would only be following the numbers for Hamilton and not Wenham. So regardless of what Wenham did, Hamilton would be based on that. And so, you know, again, Desi, I don't know why they made that decision, but we tried to average, we aggregated both towns so that we'd have a larger denominator. So that was the number which was based on was an aggregate and not individual towns. So uh, again, you know, as much as Desi has provided guidance, they gave a little interesting sort of uh, um, curveball with that recommendation. Well, uh, Andrew, I'm going to comment on what you just said. I, I studied what Desa um, issued and all that they did in the case of multiple town school districts was select a town with the, lar the larger population figure as the basis for the metric, uh, in effect ignoring the smaller population town. I, I, personally, I think that's oversimplifying matters. And I like what you said. I think the truth is, let's everybody think about this for a minute. We are two towns separated by an artificial political boundary line and we are a community of one school district, a community of one library, a community of one parks and recreation a district function, a manager, et cetera. We're a town, we're a community where we share multiple DPW functions. We're a town, we're a community of one community of, of one um, the community center of Hamilton and Wenham, there are, uh, there are many more instances to uh, indicate that we're one community that happens to have two towns comprising it. I personally believe that what we ought to do is treat this as one community and combine the numbers of Hamilton and Wenham. And both you and Dr. LaRosa pointed out the smaller the denominator, the easier it is to, um, to end up with a result that puts you in a higher risk category than I think is really appropriate for the community as a whole. Right, and just my point being that, you know, I've heard a lot of comments from um, the citizens of Hamilton and Wenham about, you know, why don't we use the metrics for Desi and I, again, I don't necessarily have any argument with the Desi recommendations, but do we take them fully or do we take pick and choose what we want? And so that's why I bring that up is if, if we go full DESI, right, then we pick the four to eight, but we also pick only Hamilton, not Wenham. And then we, you know, and then we have further guidance from the super, uh, whatever, we got that letter today. I don't know who's the superintendent yeah. of all schools or whatever. So I just want just us, the board to, you know, again, how much do we pick and choose? We like this one, we like this one, but we don't like this one. So I just want to be aware of, of what we're doing uh, when we make any decision. Andrew, that's a very valid concern. I appreciate what you're saying. You're right. Um, we, sh we, 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 we could be accused of cherry picking data or cherry picking um, independent variables in our calculations. I think that I think that would um, reflect poorly on the board. So, right. I mean, again, even for example, the uh, percent positivity that Dr. LaRosa was speaking of, you know, Hamilton's actually trended up because yeah. the denominator was small, but ours went down actually, our study, because in fact, uh, because Gordon College did so many tests and they had a few right. positives that it actually made our number go down. So here's a case where Gordon College actually helped us out because they did you know, 1600 tests and we had five positive, that brought our percent, um, percent positivity down. So again, it's one of these things where you can't take a number by itself. You got to take it in context of whatever is going on. And then, which is a much more difficult, you know, again, discussion when you look at changing modes of learning that you really have to have a discussion. And I think the guidance today of using multiple weeks of data is probably an important thing. Oh, Mary Beth, do you have a question? 
The one comment I was uh, anticipating making is as you're discussing the um, metrics that the boards developed, I thought it was a really valuable when, when we were all looking at other states prior to DESE coming out with anything or DPH providing anything to the state about you know, any sort of guidelines. We were doing research about what was happening in other states, what's happening in Tennessee and Colorado and Minnesota, and we're reading, 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 trying to find some things to guide this decision-making. When we were well along in that process, finally the state did come out with them. But one of the, I can't remember which state it was, we were looking at both external metrics and internal metrics. And the internal metrics had to do with how well is the district prepared for the, um, the internal environment of the schools, as well as the students within the school to be in compliance with all of the different um, mitigation strategies. And so that was something, that's a part of the piece that the boards developed that I think is really valuable, seeking input from uh, the school faculty about, you know, how is this going? Are there things that we need to either remediate or are there things going on in the schools that are a real cause for concern? So that's that's a piece that I would call the public's attention to that I, I think is valuable. Absolutely, I agree. Dr. Perez helped develop that. In fact, that very component of the metric, I like it. I think it's very appropriate and I, that, that's gotta stay in, of course. So so is, is, is there any either consensus or objection on this matter of do we combine the two towns to make a single uh, a single um, uh, incidence rate or not? I don't know. Dr. Perez? David, excuse me. I just wanted to bring your attention that um, Michelle Bailey from the chairman of the school committee is raising her hand and has been, and I didn't know if you noticed. I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. So, um, I felt that the DESE original guidance was really just a punt on their part um, because to just say pick the larger one is just not doing any sort of analysis of what's going on in the communities. Um, and I use this example a lot is that for Essex Tech, they're like, just use Peabody. When if you took the number of Peabody students, they're actually a vast minority because they come from so many other communities. And um, I, I do applaud the fact that we use all of the communities from where our students come um, in that metric right now. And I also feel like that also creates this larger population um, to pull from to get an idea of the community transmission because we have to keep in mind that the, the kids that are coming into the building are coming from communities all over the North Shore, as are our staff. And so it's not just Hamilton, Wenham children and adults inside our buildings. Thank you, Michelle. Um, okay. Uh, Dr. Perez, do you have any thoughts on this matter of whether we calculate two separate numbers for Hamilton and Wenham? or whether it's preferable to combine the two into a single number? I have a preference to combine the two. I, I think that it just makes the most sense. Even though we are two separate communities, we function as one. And in that sense, we are creating an arbitrary divide that does not exist. Um, I'm not an advocate for skewing data. I think that we need to be cautious in our approach. Um, and I think, and again, when it comes to this metric, this system, this guideline, my understanding is that even with whatever number we choose, be it 6, 8, 10, 12, whatever new guideline comes out, I think the bottom line is we have to understand the context before any decision can be made. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, any, any other board member have comments or thoughts? I do, David. Christopher Small, um, I would agree. I think that we should combine the two, the two towns numbers. Okay. I think that makes sense. The way we decided to include all of the students from outside of Hamilton and Wenham who go to school in Hamilton. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. David, Mary Beth Ting have... has a comment. Yes, Mary Beth. If I may, I, I, I'm sure you're aware of this, but just for the public, um, in the 
worksheets in the Excel workbook, there are, I think it's 10 different sheets. So there's a sheet that's tracking the numbers for Wenham, Hamilton, and then Hamilton, Wenham aggregate. So when you see the sheets that are um, hopefully publicly posted, um, you'll see separate sheets for Wenham and Hamilton, but the aggregate is what's drawing things. And then there's a sheet for surrounding communities. And then there are ones um, that are placeholders right now as we're going forward, but for each school within the district and then for the district <coughs> aggregate. Okay, and, and Mary Beth, thank you very much for posting those, which reminds me, I wanna mention, uh, I, are those posted yet on the Town of Wenham website? I'm checking right now. Okay, and I do want to mention for everyone. They're not Mary Beth. In, I'm sorry. I'm know. working on it. Okay. Um, Dr. LaRosa's statement is posted on the Town of Hamilton website, along with uh, alongside the metrics document and the matrix. If anyone would like to uh, read it, um, did I see? Who, who else? Somebody wanted to comment. Was that Michelle? Looks like Giselle had her hand up. Dr. Perez. Dr. Perez? Yeah, you know, I think though, what I want to, what I would like to see us leave with today though, there's this huge dependence on numbers based on limited data, right? Because I hear, and, and Dr. Lewis, it is wonderful to have you here. I, I agree with everyone. It's important to have another specialist amongst us. So it's wonderful to see your input here. But at the same time, when it comes to research, it's important to acknowledge that for every study that you find in sort of support of one supposition, you will also find a study in opposed to that. So with regards to even the, the issue of transmission within children, we know the recent study that came out from MGH suggesting that there are there is um, high level of viral load spread amongst children who have um, minimal symptoms. Um, I think even this, uh, the article that you cited or that you sent to us um, articulated the fact that I, I think to pull on here, it actually says, the, I, I read the re, sort of the broader context from the summary that you sent us. It, it, it alluded to this fact that this review of evidence has shown that children do become infected and when symptomatic, shed virus in similar quantities to adults and can transmit the disease as effectively as adults in households. And I think when we're comparing what is happening in schools in Europe versus here, we also have to keep into, um, take into consideration that the amount of virus, so the baseline that they have actually is lower than our baseline. So I think to compare the two, I, I worry um, because I don't think it's an, a, a, a fair comparison because there are many other factors that I, I would like to see accounted for in that. So with that, the reason I bring that up is because I feel like even if we were to, to combine the denominator, which obviously will increase, right? It will make it rather, we would need more cases to move, to toggle back and forth. I think what I would like to see our, the, the committee who actually chooses to close schools, to move to remote, because the Board of Health did not do that or did not offer a recommendation to that. Um, I would like to see that they're looking not at the numbers, not in isolation, but rather at where it's coming from, how it's happening, what it looks like to then make a decision as to how to toggle between remote and hybrid. Uh, Dr. Perez, I, I want to second as strongly as I can what you just said and translate that into action as follows. Um, uh, Superintendent Banos and I have had a conversation about this in which we agreed that any changes in the learning mode of the school district are not going to be in future, will not be taken based on a pure number that something went from one to two or something went from 10 to five and therefore we are going to change the learning mode. Instead, we're going to work together to inform, inform the numbers with some intelligence behind the numbers as to what are the trends, what, what, what are the trends over uh, varying time intervals, a week, two weeks, a month, um, what are the specifics to any increase in numbers? Are they, uh, are they isolated hotspots? Are they spread throughout the community? What are the characteristics of these changes in numbers that we should 
consider before we make any decisions to change a learning mode. And I, I'm comfortable with that uh, commitment that the chairs of the boards of Hamilton and Wenham will be a party to the decision making, not, not to dictate, but to advise and give the school district the best advice we can on how to, how to uh, take into consideration all of the meaningful data that we can bring to bear on decision making. So I'll stop there. Um, can you explain that quickly? So there's a COVID response team who took the matrix or metrics or whatever we're calling it that the Board of Health created. Yes. And from that, they made a decision mm -hmm. based on that information. Now you're saying there's a third step that they have to call you and Andrew to get your permission? Uh, I think, Michelle, the way it should work is this. The, the, the COVID response team will get regular reports on, uh, to, to be simplistic, the color. Are we red or yellow or green as a function of the numbers that are produced out of the metric? But if we're in a given state today, whatever it is, yellow, and the numbers in the metric suggest, well, put us in a new category, whether it's red or green, before the COVID response team leaps to a decision, oh, we're now in red or we're now in green, the COVID response team would consult with the two boards of health chairmen to ask for some, some context, some help in in advi some advice on how to interpret that number, that new pr perspective number, whether it means red or green, and is it the right way to, to respond to that number, or are there lots of mitigating factors in the data? Are there underlying, tr are, even though we may say, say, well, the number of this report is the same as the number ran last report, however, there are some disturbing trends in the data that suggest to us we had better be prepared to change our learning mode um, in anticipation of what looks to be a troubling uh, development and, and maybe the next report we fear is gonna be um, a, high, a, a yellow from a green or a red from a yellow. That's what we, I think, have an obligation to do with the COVID response team. Isn't that the role of the public health nurses on the COVID response team? I think the answer is theoretically yes, but I think that in, in, in it would be more appropriate for that role uh, to be in the, it, to, for that role to be the boards of health chairman and not the public health nurses. That's and my why, opinion. Why, do, why are the chairs more qualified than, the, than other members on the committee? I think it, 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 it isn't, that isn't automatically the case. I just think it's trying to bring a perspective to bear. Nobody has- I personally, as a committee chair, would never speak on behalf of my board without having a consensus of my board. Mm -hmm. So I just think when you take it to the committee is being spoken for by the chair, you're taking mm -hmm. the authority away from the, the committee itself. All right. Implicit in what I said is that I would never act in a situation like that unilaterally. I would certainly gain the, the, the advice and consent of the board before doing something like that. Andrew, would you like to speak on that issue? So the way I think maybe this would be um, more uh, easier for you to digest is since the numbers in which we post come from the public health nurses, right? In their, in their um, gathering of data, which comes out every Wednesday from DPH. That if there is, I think if we recognize something or the public health nurse recognizes some trend that is um, a little bit of alarming, that in the presentation of the data to the task force, there can be some, um, a little narrative 
with that as it's presented to the task force? Would that make more sense, I think, is that since, you know, the public health nurses are looking at it, they, um, they have a, a good uh, bird's eye view to wonder, well, why, the, you know, suddenly the numbers change. I know exactly where it comes from because MAVEN, um, the epidemiologic survey tool that they use tells me, let's say it is a cluster at somewhere, that when the number is presented that they can provide, I think, a better narrative to it so that that would be included in your decision-making process. So we wouldn't come necessarily, Dave and I wouldn't be part of your meeting. I think it'd be better if we looked at it and, and obviously the public health nurses can, can discuss it um, amongst themselves or at least ask for some, um, um, some information from the board uh, chairs um, but I think that that would be a better um, way to approach it is to say, as, as the public health nurses from both boards come to you and say the numbers went up, but here's the narrative associated with it. So let's take that in consideration. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, oh. <laughs> I was just gonna say, it seems overly cumbersome to have a group that's to make a decision and then or, or to advise Mary Beth. And then Mary Beth has to go and call another group of people. That seems overly cumbersome. If I, if I could jump in here just a, a bit to, to share a couple of thoughts. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind in this conversation is the, uh, the quote, um, for every complex problem, there's a simple solution that doesn't work. And I, I think that we're certainly I can tell you the the intent that I and I believe of the committee entered into this was that there would be a number that would dictate when we shifted. Um, and I think that that's also true for most districts that there was this sense that when this number hit we had a responsibility to shift our mode of learning. Um, certainly what we're learning in implementation is that it's just simply not that simple. Um, as David referenced today, the state sent out guidance now saying that you should have three consecutive weekly reports and looking for trends and not, not move based on one set of, of data. Um, and that, that is, that's thinking that's evolving and learning and, and we are clearly iterating as we go through the process. So one of the things that I've taken away is after working through this is that it, it is not a simple decision that is going to easily be made by a, a, a single metrics that says, if this, then do that. It's too cumbersome. Um, and too complex. And so the question is, given that, you know, who are the people that need to um, help us make that decision? You know, I, I will clearly say I, I am not a medical expert and I don't feel that I am well qualified to make that decision and that we do need guidance from the medical community. Um, one of the things that David and I had discussed was if, we, if it looks like the numbers are suggesting that we should move to a different mode of learning, what, what we know is that's a remarkable um, step in terms of what it means for families, what it means for our teachers, and that we, we should get as much guidance and input as possible before a decision of that magnitude is made. Um, and so how we pull our medical experts in the community um, together to get that input would be important. Um, and we can continue to, to discuss what that might look like. But what I see here is that the initial plan of when the, a certain number occurs, that it triggers a change is too simplistic. And, and we've seen the impact of that. So, you know, how, you know, how do we get our medical groups together to advise us um, based on the trends? What is the, the most um, appropriate course of action for our schools to keep our communities safe, but also to avoid pivots that are not necessary, knowing that they can be incredibly disruptive to families and to the education process. Um, so those are a couple thoughts that I have sitting where I sit and um, you know, thought it would be helpful to share them. Yeah. And the other thing, though, is Mary Beth, is that 
if you were to have, I think um, there was just that discussion, like three kids from one pod test positive in one day, you need the ability to move nimbly without, you know. Yeah, that would be one of the questions I would have is, is there a situation that would require that we immediately make a change, right? That the, the numbers are so compelling or the, what is, is contributing to those numbers suggests a real risk for the community that doesn't allow for three weeks of trend data, right? That, that the risk is too high. And, and, what, and we do need the ability to do that if necessary. Um, and you know, to what extent board chairs or other members of the Board of Health are available to, to join us in the deliberation around whether or not that's, that's appropriate is, is a question. But, I, but, I, but one of the things that would be helpful, you know, is there a situation, and I suspect that there would be, that would say the school ne needs to immediately react to the situation and we have to have the ability to do that should it occur. I think Mary Beth Ting has had her hand up for not for a bit. So Mary Beth, I, I appreciate so much what you've had to say about those things. And the reaction that I would have is the um, information that came out from Desi today, I think really speaks to what you're talking about, that um, the language is, um, before a final decision is made on a school or district closure, the superintendent must consult with DESI for further guidance. Contact the DESI Rapid Response Health Center at this number. So to me, I think, you know, I don't know if our, our district is the only one or whether there have been others that have sort of stimulated this kind of guidance from them that, you know, the COVID response team could meet and talk about what's going on. If it's to uh, Michelle Bailey's example, three positives within a cohort, we're calling DESI, we're calling DESI with one positive case, whether it's a student or a staff member. And so that's going to, to do the nimbleness that you're talking about with without waiting for the trends, you know, whether it's a one day closure, you know, in, it, in here it talks about whether it's a one day closure for deep clean or whether it's a longer term for quarantine of a larger population. So I think that's in response to what you're saying. And I see that Dr. Perez has her so I think if I, forgive me if I misremember this report, but I, I thought that document that we worked on outlined a narrative describing these situations that should be considered when presented with a situation like we were presented with. So because what I would recommend, I understand sort of that we're at this um, cross point where we're not sure or where it seems like we're not sure how to move forward in the situation that we're presented with numerous cases. But what I would recommend is I think, if I recall correctly, that document lists a series of factors that would need to be consider considered when presented with cases in terms of where is it happening? How is it happening? And then in addition to that, if there is gray area, that's when I would encourage if there is not a consensus then I actually think it would be valuable to reach out to the chairs. So I understand that maybe it's, again, not a black or white situation. Um, we need to provide the schools with, with as much guidance as possible to ensure the safety of our students and our teachers. But I think this document, again, we can't depend on a number because ultimately I think it is still arbitrary given the limited data that does exist to date. And I think we need to have an outline, take that number, in the context of the narrative, what are the things that are happening around this situation, and then make a determination. And if it's gray, then seek some additional input. That would be how I would like to see this proceed. Right. Um, Mary Beth and Michelle, there, there are two somewhat different cases at hand here. Our document, our, mate, our metrics, were largely focused on the community at large and that context for what to do about the schools. Whereas the specific case that you've raised, Michelle, about let's say three positives in a single class or classroom or school building, those are internal to the school itself. 
we address them in our report, but really the, the, the reaction to those is governed by the pro protocols that have been developed, I believe, by the school nurses and the public health nurses um, under the guidance of DESE on what to do in those cases. And that's a little bit beyond the purview of the Board of Health. Not independent of, but it's, it, it's basically a case contained to the school's peer itself. Yeah, and are you, aware, are you aware of the incidents in Newberry and in Lincoln Sudbury and the boards of health closing their schools due to large gatherings of high school students not following protocols? I and, have heard about many of them, yes. Um, and I'm just curious if you're in contact with the police here in our towns in instances where that might not be happening or that is happening. Uh, I am familiar with such an instance, which fortunately did not involve any school students. Um, but it, let me be specific. If a report came into the police of a party that clear, appeared to clearly violate all of the rules that all of the procedures we've come to understand you've got to follow to minimize the transmission um, of, of COVID-19. And it involved school students in a large number. I think the school, I think our Board of Health would have to take an, an immediate action. Would you and be notified would, the, the, action, the action we would take would be appropriate to the facts of the circumstance. Would you be notified of it? Are the police under direction to notify you of it? The answer is yes, on the basis of all of my experience with uh, the police department to date and what they, how they, re how they respond to any calls that come in that, uh, that, that complain about any situation like that. Look, if somebody has a party in their backyard on a 10 acre estate and you can't see it from the street and you can't hear it from the, any neighbors, it's totally private. Uh, we don't have the power to, uh, I, I, I'm just struggling. How do, we, how do we even know that's going on? What we know about is what fortunately has been um, reported in calls to the police typically by a concerned resident. That's typically how this starts. The police respond. Um, they have routinely called me um, under the instruction of the police chief to ask them how they should respond to it and I follow up. So if we learn that it's school, if, 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 in, in all likely, let's say high school students, we'd respond accordingly. And if I felt that it was appropriate, I'd, I'd assemble the Board of Health and we would um, examine the facts. And if it warranted, uh, we notify the school district that we, we thought it was appropriate to take some, some direct and immediate action. Uh, I, thank God that hasn't happened yet. So one more comment from Mary Beth and then David, I think we should go to six. Okay. Unless there's more um, discussion. Okay. Um, so to answer uh, Michelle Bailey's question, um, I would just say that in Wenham, there are weekly meetings between public health, public safety, and town administration. And so any issues like that get funneled together and communicated to the Board of Health. So that's how it's working in Wenham. Okay. Yeah, th thank you, Mary. I think this, I think it sounds like we've got a good situation uh, with our respective police departments so far. All right, I'm gonna to move to item six on the agenda. All right, specifically under the terms of item six on our agenda. I move that the Hamilton Board of Health in the document entitled, quote, COVID-19 metrics for Hamilton Wenham Regional School District, unquote, and the accompanying matrix, which were approved by vote of the board at its August 26th meeting, be revised effective immediately as follows, colon, Number one, 
change the seven day rolling average daily cases per 100,000 numbers to be equal to the numbers specified in the August 11th, 2020 DESE quote, guidance for district and schools on interpreting DPH COVID-19 metrics, unquote, to combine Hamilton and Wenham as a single community for purposes of computing the seven-day average numbers, and further three, um, empower the chairman to make these changes to the document and matrix and Note them as, quote, revised per Board of Health vote on September 14th, 2020, unquote, and submit them immediately to the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District. Um, let's uh, start. Is there a second? For, well, first David, all, can I, David, can I just yeah. make one uh, adjustment? You had mentioned number two being using the population of both Hamilton and Wenham as your denominator, but you said seven day. Do we want to make that 14 day or we keep the seven day? as just a way to calculate the 14 day? It's the latter and I'll get to that in the discussion. Okay. Um, is, is there a second for the motion? I second the motion, Christopher Small. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Um, Andrew, exactly response to your question. I note Dr. LaRosa's a point about the seven day versus the 14 day rolling averages. And in my study of all of these reports and documents, some use a seven day rolling average, some use a 14 day rolling average. The reason that we in our deliberation selected seven day over 14 day was to allow us to be a little more nimble uh, to uh, be more aware of trends that a, that, that a seven day rolling average would uh, show as opposed to a, a more smoothed 14 day rolling average. So I wanna stick to our seven day rolling averages in our computations, in our metrics. Um, but on the subject of the single community, I do think that our metric should be based on the combined population of Hamilton and Wenham as a single community, but continue, as I said, to use the seven day rolling average. And I, you know, we could debate that. And let's face it, as we're demonstrating tonight, we are constantly looking at what we've done. We are not locked, you're not cast in stone with any of this. We're trying to, um, we're, we're trying to, uh, incorporate the best data, information, uh, so, uh, credible sources we can. So this may well be, uh, this, this certainly will be subject to review and evaluation in future. But for the moment, um, what I'm thinking we should do is what I've just proposed. And again, outside of this specific motion, the context for what I'm suggesting here is that we're also going to be, look, as as he recommended in today's guidance document, looking at a broader uh, universe of data, the numbers that I specifically mentioned, for example, the positivity rate, the um, hospital population, uh, the, um, the, the longer term averages, the rolling seven day average this week, the previous week, the week before, what are the trends? Those are all things we're gonna be taking into account. So it's not, now, we're not basing momentous decisions on a single number. Um, amongst the Hamilton board members, any more discussion on the motion? Uh, Giselle? I, I agree with you, David. I think regardless of this change, the fact of the matter is that I still would like us to be cautious. It's important because we are entering a time period that we don't know what it's going to look like. We know that human behavior, especially with children, is less predictable. So while masks work, it's unclear how they will do in the school setting. Yeah. Um, so 
the numbers should reflect accurately what is happening in our community, but I would like to see that when decisions are being made, that it is again taken into consideration all factors before right. making a decision. And, and Dr. Perez, one further thought. When we made this when we made our deliberations, if you recall, we had no context for those DESE numbers and we were struggling for uh, understanding how much conservatism was built into them and what, a, what margin of safety did they incorporate? Um, and so now I've finally gotten some answers to those questions and I'm satisfied that the numbers that I'm proposing in this motion are already conservative. The, the, they, they have a margin of safety built into them. Any further discussion? All right, uh, I'd like to call for a vote on the motion. Uh, David Smith, aye. Giselle Perez, I second that motion. Did you make you, you, you vote, vote aye. Uh, wait, didn't you call the motion already or am I already asleep? I, I, I did, I called the motion, it was seconded. So we're voting on the motion now. I vote aye. I vote aye, Giselle. Uh, I vote Christopher aye. Small. Christopher Small, aye. Okay, uh, the motion carries unanimously. Um, Andrew, I'll leave it up to you to decide what you might like to do right now. Yeah, Should we so, move on? No, I, so again, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, you know, this has been a very, you know, thought provoking and important exercise by both boards of health with the community and our school committee and our superintendent as we navigate this rather um, unusual situation where, you know, we back in July, we had less data and we have more data now. And uh, the fact that DESE and the DPH continually update things, uh, I mean, it occurs to me that uh, we, we may not, this number may change again um, in the future, depending on what happens. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder though, and I hate to make a motion regarding staying with in line with what DESE puts out in the future, because um, like they did with the regional school districts of picking one small, you know, one slightly larger than the other. I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, so I, as long as you and I are both agreed to be, uh, to respond as quickly as possible for joint meeting in the future, I think that that would be helpful so that if there were any significant changes we could meet um, quickly and make some decisions. You have my commitment to that, yes. There you go. So um, I make a motion um, and, and without being, trying to copy you as <laughs> similar to the uh, uh, Hamilton Board of Health. This will be easier for Catherine who's taking minutes right now. So do I have a second? I only have one other, I hopefully Jerry's still on. I think so. Jerry, do I have a second for that motion? Yes, yes. All right, so all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Jerry Dunellen says aye, Andrew Tang says aye. Okay, um, I, I so, think we can. So at this I, point, I, think, I guess we're, we're done with that, but now I guess we will provide I guess more um, formal documentation in relate to the school committee and the um, superintendent of schools. Co correct. What, what I'm, what I'm going, uh, I'm, the motion empowers me to make these revisions to the document. Uh, I will share them with you, and then we'll jointly submit them to the school district at, at, as soon as possible tomorrow. Michelle Bailey had a question. Yeah. I we're meeting on Wednesday, so if we don't get them tomorrow, we won't be able to okay. do anything with them. For Dave, David's going to spend all night doing this. Perfect. <laughs> yes, Mary Beth Ting. David, I have those documents available to me, so you know if you want to touch base, I can help you get that done quickly and uh, get them over to the school committee and the superintendent. Okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll work Beth, with you after this. One comment, Mary Beth, thing. you may need to, to check with your child who has a birthday today whether or not that's applicable. <laughs> I get up okay. earlier than she does in the morning, so we can celebrate tonight. I can make adjustments tomorrow. 
All right. Okay. Um, David, um, excuse me. Yes. Can you can you do me a favor? This is Jackie. Um, Catherine Tinsley's just asking me. Can you clarify that you changed it to eight out of one hundred thousand, but still remain at the seven day in your motion for the minutes? What you said is correct. It okay. is eight and the not the two numbers are eight instead of six and four instead of three. And if you could please in, uh, send your final document to me so Catherine can incorporate that into the minutes as well, just so we've got all of our uh, I's dotted and T's crossed. I would really of appreciate it. Of course. Thank yes, you. I will do that. I appreciate okay. it. Yep. Um, now, if I look at the agenda, we're now on what originally was three and four, but have what have become five and six. So the next item on the agenda would be an update from the Hamilton Wyndham Regional School District leadership if they're available. And then that will be followed by reviewing our residents' feedback from our September 3rd public forum. So um, either uh, Superintendent Banos or Committee Chair um, Bailey, um, you're, it, it's optional up to you if you wish to say anything. Yeah, David, I'll, I'll speak quickly. Um, I know that this there there's been a lot to discuss this evening, and just reiterating for the community today, the DESE um, put out updated information regarding um, health metrics. Um, th this has been an issue not only in Hamilton Wenham, but in um, many districts. Uh, a, a quick other local example is Lindsay that um, last week hit the red zone uh, and that they moved immediately to go into a remote mode as well. So, you know, as we, as we learn, as we iterate um, and walk through this process, um, we, I am sure that we will con continue to get guidance and see ways that we can do things better. So I'm greatly appreciative of everybody will, coming back and willing to talk about what's working well and what's not. Um, I know as we launch our educational programs, we will be in a, a similar mode of looking at what's working and what's not. Um, so you should be aware the DESE just today released this information. And as um, Michelle Bailey shared, we will have a committee meeting on Wednesday evening, um, a, a discussion about um, any change to the metrics um, that the, the, this Board of Health has committed to will be discussed at that meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, okay. The last item on the agenda, it, 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 should, I, should I move to the last item on the agenda or any other comments? Okay. Um, we, we received a, a great many written questions at our public health forum. Uh, and I know Andrew and I have received a, a, a great many letters, emails, phone calls, et cetera, as I mentioned. Uh, and I think I can fairly well divide them into two categories. There are the category, there's the category of questions and comments that concern what we have just uh, deliberated. And I'm hoping that residents who submitted comments and questions about the metrics document and the, the numbers we selected, uh, I'm hoping that they feel that their concerns have been, uh, that we've responded to their concerns and, and have taken appropriate action on them. Uh, there is another broad category of questions and concerns that, uh, that, that Andrew and I went through and that we feel are really the purview of the, the, the school district. Uh, and I'll give you just one example. I have two pages here of written questions that came in. Uh, some of them were answered, a lot of them were not. And, and I appreciated the fact that there was concern about the, the, um, the, the, the failure in the forum to get those questions answered. 
but I'll just read one. Um, how safe can it be to play team sports during this time? Um, we have gone through this quite a bit with the director of parks and recreation for Hamilton and Wenham. And we've worked, we, we have um, been paying great close attention to the state's um, gu guidance, uh, recommendations, uh, do's and don'ts on any kind of sports activities. And we've taken them to heart and each team, each type of team sport has developed their own um, protocols for how to operate if they're allowed to in, in the first place uh, under these uh, conditions. And we've reviewed them and, and they are compliant with the state's guidelines. So that's how I'd answer that question generally. The, the more detailed question gets into, uh, in, in the case of a school sp uh, sport, like school football, let's just say, uh, how do we account for the fact that students from other towns may be um, in, in playing this team sport? And, and that's a question I can't answer. That, I think that's the purview of the school district. So um, there's, David? Yeah, yes. I think Michelle Bailey can answer that question. Okay. That is, governed by, that is governed by the MIAA and specific to football. They have determined that it is not safe to play at this time. They have moved it to a floating season, which would be sometime in February. Um, so football is not an allowed activity at this time and in if we were to be in red under the DESE metrics then no sports would be allowed so okay. it, it would be based on your community versus the sport itself but at this time football is not allowed okay and also it's the things that we don't do there's um well cheerleading is also not allowed because those two kind of go together and yeah. something else that we didn't participate in. I don't remember. Oh, uh, couples ice dancing. That was the other one. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a whole series of questions that revolve around the school facilities themselves, uh, such as um, HVAC systems, um, sanitation of equipment, um, the uh, cleaning of buildings, uh, and it goes on and on and on. Use of bathrooms in the schools, um, the protocols for entering and exiting the building. Uh, what about uh, uh, students and staff versus visitors, um, et cetera? Those are questions that I recall that were addressed by the school nurses and the, the Tom Geary and members of the school staff. And I, I just sense that, that those are outside the purview of the Board of Health and specifically within the control of the school district uh, with uh, and under the terms of some very extensive guidance issued by DESE. I mean, that's, that's the impression I have. Uh, Michelle or Mary Beth, can you answer? I mean, is, is there a, a gen is there a general way to respond to those or have those been responded to in a different forum or should I send you a copy of these comments and ask you to consider them maybe at your next committee meeting? I don't know. Well, it would have been helpful to know what these questions were in advance of okay. this particular forum so that we could have had the right people here. But uh, okay. Mary Beth is very capable of answering those questions. Yeah, I, I, you know, very, very quickly, I'll, I'll respond to some of them and then I'll, I'll give a more global answer. So in terms of the HVAC system, I, I think most of the community is aware that we engaged in a, a full study of all of our buildings and received a punch list of what it would take to bring all of our systems back up to design capacity for about 
approximately 30 students in the classroom um, uh, under the direction of um, Tom Geary. He has been going through that punch list. As of today, there were only three items left that were just regarding filter changes, and we anticipate that those will occur this week. Um, so um, I would say that by the end of this week, we are fully anticipating all outstanding items related to our HVAC system will be complete. Um, there are a wide range of processes and protocols in terms of entering buildings, in terms of um, in terms of how how restrooms are cleaned. All that, uh, all those items are either in. Um, safety procedures or in school handbooks. Um, I, I would greatly appreciate it, David, if you could send along those questions because then we can be sure that there is nothing that, that people are wondering about that we do not have an answer for them. And if we don't have that answer, we can certainly get that. Okay, great. Thank, David, thank you, Mary Beth. I will, I will do that. David, excuse me, this is Jackie. I just, for, we do have HW Cam live right now, so we are live. Um, and for folks that are at home not able to access the chat room, Tom Geary, the Director of Facilities for HWRC, did share the link for the HWRC Facilities Related Questions page, just so that folks at home who do not have access to the chat can see that that is accessible online at this time. Uh, and I also just wanted to draw your attention that we do have a hand in the meeting raised, and I know you have a lot of questions from the last time this group was all together that you wanted to address, but I just wanted to let you know in case you were going to take public input tonight before you adjourned. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Okay. Uh, there, there are a couple of general categories of questions. Um, many questions on the subject of face coverings and masks. And I know one specific um, uh, hot button on that sub is gators, G-A-I-T-E-R-S. I think it is. And I, uh, the, the members of the boards have researched this question. And right now, the subject of gators is, is, uh, is under research and investigation. There is no definitive guidance yet from either the CDC or the, the state DPH on the subject of gators. Uh, it, it's, 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 we don't know what the answer is yet to the question. Are they effective? Are they, can they be approved? Um, and our board has developed a draft guidance on the subject. And we are going where our plan is to discuss it, debate it, and uh, try to reach a final agreement on it at our next regularly, our next regularly Hamilton uh, scheduled board meeting on uh, Thursday afternoon. So on that one, um, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, wait a little bit. We'll, as soon as we do agree on something, uh, we'll issue it to the school district um, as well as the town. Uh, but again, we can't dictate what students are required to do in the schools. Uh, that's really a matter of the school district, but we will submit our uh, our guidance document, whatever we come up with, to the school district. There was a lot of questions surrounding the positive cases at Gordon College, and many people suggested, well, if we, if, I think the quote was, <clears throat> if we were closing the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District schools, why weren't we also closing Gordon College? Uh, there's a couple aspects to that question. One is, we didn't order the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Districts to go to remote learning. Uh, again, if I go back, you can just think back to what I originally said, we were asked to provide guidance. We did. We have not issued either a formal order or a mandate to the school district to either close or stay open or whatever under any circumstances, what we're doing is giving the school districts our best guidance on how to respond to the, uh, the COVID-19 numbers. Um, in the case of Gordon College, that, that is a cluster and uh, perhaps um, either uh, 
Dr. Ting or Mary Beth Ting could respond to how the town of Wenham is responding to the Gordon College situation, given that that is outside of my jurisdiction. Mary Beth, you want me to answer that? So, I mean, we've been working with Gordon College. They had um, come to us uh, early on with some um, about so, sort of the mitigation strategies they were uh, creating in their own campus. Um, and, and if you go on their website, they have a pretty um, uh, inclusive website uh, about COVID and their COVID response. Um, again, they, they tested um, over a thousand students or, and uh, others there and getting, a, you know, obviously a small number relative to their population. But obviously, those numbers uh, affected us since <clears throat> and they were, um, you know, larger than we expected. And we already had um, uh, one case on our uh, on our own. Again, I, I agree with you that a cluster like that we should take in consideration when the numbers change. Um, but it, it's one of those things where, I mean, for example, if you take my household, let's say all six of us were to get COVID. And are we a cluster? Should we be included or excluded? Now we have much more interaction with the school school district. I have three kids in the school district, right? And I have a wife who works in the school district, so that may be a different scenario. But uh, again, the the as we know, the students from Gordon College, as much as they were um, asked to be safer and remain on campus as much as possible. Um, there is, you know, obviously movement and we can't control their movement on and off campus. So is, we, can, we can caveat if there is a, a larger group or a cluster that, that occurs. Definitely, I think we should can take it in consideration, but I don't necessarily want to remove it because it's, they're still part of the community um, and they need to be part of the, those numbers that we, we look at. Mary Beth? Hi. I, I hate to be a stickler, um, but I just want to be clear on the vocabulary. And for the general public, I know that there are some words that we're using during this pandemic that have general, uh, the word cluster has a very specific definition for the Department of Public Health. So if I use the word cluster, it might mean something different than for other people on the Zoom. So. Um, there technically has not been a cluster at Gordon College. Although there have been cases, it doesn't meet the DPH definition of epidemiologic cluster. I don't want to get in the weeds about that, but it is important and that, you know, has an impact. Um, You're muted again. You hit I'm the so button. sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I think it might be helpful uh, time-wise and for um, the people who are present um, if we could, are, are the questions that you've gathered together in such a form that you might be able to share them with the school committee so that they could, I mean, some of these things have been addressed in documents that the schools have put together already. So maybe if we could forward them along to the school committee. And then if I might ask um, if Jackie might be able to allow me to share my screen because I pulled up the matrix to look at it and I really would like the board's direction on the changes that need to be made to the visual representation the, um, in going from more restrictive to less restrictive. So could I suggest that we look at that quickly together now and you just give me your thoughts about the changes you would like made? Well, Mary Beth, since we already passed the motion, now it's just a question of matching it up on the, on the illustrative matrix except for it was slightly different. Remember, they, they were not mirror images of each other. I, I understand. So, so but we, right, but our motion did not change that component as much. So I, my fear is trying to figure that out now is gonna take a little bit of time, probably more time than we have. What do you think, but, David? I thought the goal was to get this to the school committee tomorrow. Yes, but and and I just don't know whether or not David and I can work through it. And then um, I don't know, David. What do you think? I I I'll commit to getting this done tomorrow morning. If I, 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 I I'm just I think we can do it. You, I'm just wondering if you need the other board members to take a look at it. Well. 
if I take the motion at face value, the board has empowered me to, um, to revise the report per the terms of the motion and no more and no less. If I may. If, if uh, Dr. Perez, if you would like to have a look at it, uh, please tell <laughs> me. Um, I would love to. I have meetings all day tomorrow. Um, so <laughs> I, <laughs> maybe some time in between now and tomorrow a.m. Right. Um, uh, but I wanted. Right. To, I think the only input that I would want to make is just what in those metrics, because I think last I saw that, and I, and I agree, maybe spending too much time will delay, belabor the, the cause, but as long as it's clear that there's a reference to the na narrative, that it shouldn't, those numbers should not be taken in isolation. Okay. Um, but I also want to okay. mention one more thing, and I know we're all tired, but I, I think especially when it comes to the import of public health, we, I would like to see us address all the questions in summary that our um, residents do have, because I think it's important to ensure that we're being thorough. Um, so I do think that there's a value to what you've been doing, David. Okay. So can I just ask a clarifying question? So what Mary Beth Ting was just saying is the moving out of hybrid and moving into hybrid had different numbers. Are you now changing them to be the same numbers? That is, that is correct. That is what the motion specifies. Yes. Was that the question, Mary Beth? Indeed it was. Okay. Um, David, did you, David and Andrew, did you want to take the one public comment that we have? We have a hand raised still before oh. you adjourn. Sorry, I just didn't want you to forget about it. Sure. Um, which one? Where is it? Who is it um, from? It's a hand raised from Dan Pascarello, which I just happen to know is a one I'm resident. Dan, are you still on? I think I see you. I am. Hi, Dan. Um, what you have a comment or a question? Hi, Andrew. It, it's it's more of a, a comment. Um, and again, my name is Dan Pascarello. I'm a Wenham resident. I'm also a member of the Wenham Planning Board, um, and I'm also a parent of a Hamilton Wenham student. Um, so first, I want to thank the board members and the committee members for the service and time. <clears throat> that you're putting into this. I know this isn't easy. Um, and I appreciate the small change that you've made to the metrics tonight. I would encourage you to go further. Um, I think that there's two major things that are being lost in this discussion. And one of that, one of the things is the harm that's being inflicted on our students by not being able to get back to school. The purpose of what DESE and DPH was doing was to affect a balance here. It's not a pure epidemiological look, but they're trying to work in the educational issues as well. And the second thing that I'm concerned about is how far these metrics are going and really that they're setting us up. It's a prescription almost for failure because while we've changed one minor thing tonight, I think what you've changed is the redefinition of the, um, the thresholds back to what Desi says. But if you look at the charts, there's really seven or eight other things that go far beyond what the state guidelines set out. So as you've already discussed, you've lowered the metric from the 14 day average to the seven day average for shutdowns. And I think it is still the opposite for opening up, that you're still keeping a 14 day window for opening up as opposed to the seven day you're looking at at shutdowns. You've also mentioned that you rejected the key municipality standard that Desi put out, which is we just look at Hamilton. The reason that's important in this case is because it would obviously take Gordon College out of our equation. Um, in addition to that, there's an introduction of a surrounding community standard in the metrics, which includes, I think, 12 other communities, which also includes Salem, Peabody, and Gloucester in that mix. Um, they also have a seven-day incidence rate. On top of that, there are two subjective measures about compliance um, that I think are going to be voted on by teachers on daily Google Forms, whether people are wearing masks or socially distancing or whether this is interfering with education. The problem I see with that is those standards are vague, the measures are unrealistic for staying open, and they could be subject to manipulation. And finally, 
what I think is most concerning about this chart is that all of the measures have to be met in order to stay in a particular modality. So if, for example, if we have in-person learning, as I understand it, if the compliance measure falls below 91% on those teacher forms, you're going to have to drop back down to hybrid. So I think it's important for everybody to understand just how far beyond the state metrics these are going. Um, I'd encourage you to consider the purpose of the balance here and to adhere to what the state guidelines are. Thank you for taking my comment. I, th I think that those are, are good points. I, again, I think it's a discussion of the overall guidance. Um, we built them as best as we could. And um, again, the school committee can decide to what weight those metrics have in any decision of changing learning mode. I mean, again, for example, there are certain cities that have zero incidents, but have chosen to go remote. So uh, numbers don't necessarily are prescriptive to what you should do or what you can do. And so I, I you know, again, I, I, from what the, you know, again, the superintendent is here and the chairperson is here, I think they're gonna take those in consideration now um, and as well as what Desi has put out further in terms of more um, guidance. Um, but I, I, you know, as, as you know, Dr. LaRosa was speaking in terms of, you know, the numbers, when we look at the surrounding town, all of Essex, which includes Lynn and Revere, uh, we're doing okay in terms of percent positivity. So whether those surrounding towns have a huge effect, we assume that they won't given that the entire county of Essex is rather still doing well. Um, but, um, um, you know, again, those are some, those were metrics made to help us make a larger picture decision. And so uh, I agree with you that maybe um, that the, the, what we put in there um, is a guidance that we think was best at the time. And this is again, starting in July when we started this exercise and, and, it, and it obviously shifted. Um, but I think that the task force from the, from the school will probably take a lot more in consideration when making any kind of changes in mode of learning style, given what you said about, uh, and I think we all agree because we all have children, or most of us have children in the school district of shifting back and forth, back and forth. So we don't want that to happen as well. Um, Dr. Perez, I know you're waiting patiently. Yeah, so can you tell? Very observant. Um, so Dan, I, I appreciate your comments um, and really do value your opinion, um, but I have to respectfully disagree on two important points, which is the tracking of information, especially with respect to the teachers. In the end, again, I do wanna emphasize that human behavior is one of the most unpredictable factors here. And in order to ensure the safety of our students and our teachers, that relies on the use of mitigation strategies, which we, as a parent, I'm not in the school system. So if that goes unmonitored, then that could actually increase the risks, again, to the students, the teachers, and their families, and the community as a whole. So I think while it might look like the metrics are arbitrarily designed, again, there isn't anything for us to go by. We need to create something. And based on our understanding, we created something that allows teachers to at least provide the feedback that they need to provide in terms of what they're observing in their classrooms. Now, again, as Dr. Tang and David has artic have articulated here, these are guidelines and they should never be taken as a single number. It's not a black or white situation. And I think one would argue that with this pandemic, we can't approach it as such. But we do need to have some criteria that we are tracking. And I think in particular, when you're thinking about this aspect of hybrid versus remote, we are looking at providing students with two days in school, of which half the time is going to be spent on mitigation strategies. So we need to figure out to what extent is that interfering with learning? And I think what I would like to see is at the end of the school year, when we're seeing how our students are performing, both on the remote and on the hybrid level, we have data that we can then start sort of conducting our own analysis to figure out what does that actually look like. Um, but I think to make this assumption that it's causing, um, you know, 
any time that there is inconsistency for children, that is a concern. So I value that. And I don't, I don't necessarily approve of the toggling back and forth, but I do think that removing that altogether um, is not necessarily going to benefit our community as a whole. Um, may I respond briefly? Sure. And yeah, quick, you get, you get just very 30 quickly, seconds. Yeah. Dr. Perez, yeah, thank you. I'm not suggesting that there shouldn't be monitoring. I'm just raising the point as to how that's going to factor in the decision to whether keep the schools open or not. And with respect to the numbers, my concern is the arbitrariness with which the numbers are being um, arrived at. And I went back and took a look at the board's joint meeting from August 12th, and it was disturbing at how often that term was being thrown around because I know that everybody in town is, is looking to the expertise of the boards here. So if we are gonna go beyond what the state metrics require, I mean, we should have a solid foundation for doing that. And my concern is that we don't in this case, and that it could lead to keeping the school shut down for a very prolonged period, which I don't think anybody wants. It, it would in isolation, um, I hear you. Um, but again, I think while it seems arbitrary, based on the metrics, if you have one of every two students, for instance, on a regular basis, not wearing a mask, so 50% of the students not wearing masks, I would be concerned by that. And I would like to see the school involved in, in addressing that. And actually the metrics themselves don't suggest that we should school, close schools because of this one time, you know, 50% students are not wearing masks. It's actually what is outlined is to observe, to figure out what is happening and what can we do to improve that. So this, again, a public health intervention, what is the issue? Do we need to work on um, increasing our delivery of information? And if there isn't a change after a period of time, then that would suggest action. And again, the action is never all or nothing. So I, I don't believe that the metrics as designed would, would immediately indicate that the schools need to close after a one-time instance, but it is a need to closely track um, behavior as it's occurring. Uh, so doesn't that metric include things like the ability to access PPE and cleaning supplies? I think that's in that met matrix in some ways too, if I don't recall correctly. Yeah, I, I, you know, th those are part of the in internal um, factors in terms of being able to be, um, um, mitigation ready. And again, you know, with Desi's now new guidance of using, you know, trends over several weeks, uh, I think that we'd have to see, I mean, obviously if, if face covering usage and, and hand washing or hand disinfecting went down, uh, it would be at least noticed and then some education or reaffirmation of doing that. And then, you know, watch it over time, go back up and, you know, having, making sure kids are safe uh, I think it's the, the goal rather than to be uh, punitive. Uh, like the board has, you know, in the last year passed several <clears throat> orders, um, many of which the first offense is education um, and using that as the primary um, measure or primary response to things that occur. So as much as possible, I think it's going to be education of, hey, we can do better than this. Um, let's try to wear our face covering more often and, and things like that. So um, um, that is my hope that yeah. that's how it will be taken quickly, away. Yeah, I could quickly jump in here, Andrew, and just share that the way that the data collection is set up is that there's a brief survey that teachers would answer at the end of the day and that information goes to the principals um, and the, the survey asks who you know where is the data coming from with the idea being that the principals can monitor that and if there is a, a particular place in the school that is not having compliance or a particular classroom that is having difficulty then the principal can work with that that teacher in that location to help um, improve compliance. So I would agree that the intent there or, um, is to identify places where we don't, we don't have the appropriate use of mitigation strategies and look for ways to improve that. 
I would just add quickly to uh, Michelle Bailey's question about the internal facilities sort of things in terms of disinfection and supply of PPE, that although um, we did develop two Google Forms to measure compliance with mitigation strategies and effective mitigation strategies on, on learning, um, facilities director Tom Geary is on the COVID response force. So there's no particular uh, form to collect that information, but he sits on that, um, that team and so is able to speak to those things. So if there started to be uh, stop gaps in supplies coming in or something like that, he, he would be able to bring that information to bear. Okay. Uh, th there's a couple of questions that I'm looking at on the chat board that I can respond to quickly. Someone has asked us whether our guidance on masks will apply to people who work in buildings in town, and the answer is yes. Um, let's see. There was a question about... Um, uh, Dr. LaRosa wants, uh, somebody wants Dr. LaRosa to be included in all our decisions, et cetera. And, uh, while he has volunteered his time, um, I cannot uh, ask that he um, uh, contribute even more of his time to any kind of official position with respect to the board. All I can ask is that to the extent he might have time and would express willingness to review or critique uh, either a draft document or something we're proposing to do, I will appreciate it. But um, he, he has been uh, extremely generous with his time already uh, in helping us, and I uh, I'm, I'm pleased. So uh, I, I I'm I'm a little embarrassed to ask for more, but uh, we'll see. Um, and a few more questions about. Um, if if the, if this metric applies to schools, should it also apply to businesses, restaurants, et cetera? Uh, that is a that's a different realm. The schools are one realm. We've been asked to provide guidance for the schools we have, and we're and obviously we are very amenable to considering what we've done and trying to uh, improve it. And as new information as as, uh, as we learn, we'll continually reevaluate it and uh, update it. Uh, we, we're, we're not uh, wedded to anything in particular at the, at the moment, at least. And so what about businesses and restaurants? They are governed by very specific state rules, orders, guidelines, et cetera, that, are, that, that, that we don't control. Uh, we are the enforcement mechanism <laughs> as we have learned from the state, the enforcement mechanism for these orders and guidelines and, and, and conditions that are imposed on retail outlets, restaurants, uh, office buildings, you, you name it, uh, they all have their own set of, th of, of guidelines they've got to uh, operate by. Um, I, that, I'm going to stop there. I think that those are the, those are the ones I can readily respond to. I will uh, send a copy of this to the school district and um, ask them to respond if if we haven't already to the questions that are under that are in their within their purview. And so, let's see. Um, I don't know, Jackie, um, Mary Beth, are there other things that we have failed to respond to here that we should? Um, David, if I may, Catherine Kinsley is taking minutes of this meeting and we have the recording of the previous forum. So I know you've got the list that you and Dr. Ting worked on, um, yeah. but what I might recommend is that we compile the list of the chat from tonight and the chat from the forum and put together a written FAQ that we can put together this week and put on the Board of Health websites for both towns so that all, um, and I'd be happy to collaborate with the school district as well as the two boards to ensure this project gets completed by the end of this work week. And that way the two boards can um, conclude their business but still get all this information out to folks who are interested. 
um, and then we can set it up like an FAQ and you can look at different topic areas with your questions um, the way we did uh, for a Wenham forum a couple months ago. Um, but I'm happy to coordinate that so folks okay. feel like we can answer all the public's questions, um, but also not um, not feel like we're starting to um, repeat those answers uh, for folks that are still live with us tonight, if that's amenable to both boards. Uh, Jackie, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I endorse what you just said. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda, schedule our next meeting. I, I think it's probably premature to do that. I think we're just going to have these uh, joint meetings, uh, Andrew, as, um, as the circumstances require. What do you think? Andrew, we don't have any volume from you. You're not muted, but you just been talking to yourself for a minute there. Um, so I'm, oh, I'm presuming yeah. that you're okay with not scheduling another meeting because we are missing Regina tonight too. I, yeah, I can read your mind even if I can't um, hear what you're saying, so. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jackie. Um, with that, I think we're ready to adjourn. So um, if there's no other new business comments, concerns at this moment. Um, I move that the Hamilton Board of Health adjourn this meeting. Uh, is there a second? There's a second, Christopher Small. Okay, meeting to adjourn has been moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. David Smith, aye. Aye, David. aye, Christopher Small. Okay, that makes it unanimous. Our board has adjourned. Can you hear me now? Oh, good. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, I motion that the Wenham Board of Health adjourn. Uh, do I have a second? Second from Jerry. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye, 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 aye. Jerry's okay. got three ayes. Andrew Ting, aye. We are all now right. adjourned. All right. Th thank you, everyone who attended tonight. We appreciate your interest. Um, and uh, stay safe, everybody. Good night.